morning. Our reading today is super long. I don't actually know that we need to do it now because that was a really good recap, Rob. Uh, but I'm going to read the whole thing anyway because it's a really good, non-boring story. Jonah 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing? Sound asleep. Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, Come, let us cast lots so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lots fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what, of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, he replied. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? for the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon us. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. And they cried out to the Lord, please, O oh Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord of, out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me, the deep surrounded me, weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish. It spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across, and Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast 
and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock, shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Whew. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. I need a drink of water after that story. Super long, but such a great cinematic story. I like it. True God in this story is way more vengeful than I'm comfortable with. This is Hebrew Bible God, after all, and Hebrew Bible God more often than not goes to extreme measures to get the point across, but I like the story anyway. I've always appreciated a really good anti-hero, so maybe that's it. They're always more real to me, more human than the good as gold or evil as sin characters. The Bible is full of such characters. No doubt you'll encounter another one of, or two of them as we continue through this series of heroes and songs. And Jonah is a classic case. A man called by God to act heroically in his story, but he can't quite cast himself in that role. The road he's been called to is too dangerous, too arduous, and the people hardly worth it. Ninevites were Israel's sworn enemies, after all. He runs, but God has other plans, plans that involve a storm and a large aquatic animal sent to get Jonah's attention. That's another theme that recurs a bunch in this series. The great lengths God is willing to go to in order to get our attention and the animals God uses to do so. I love these kinds of stories. So often it's stories like these that foster our connection to faith and to God and to each other. From an early age we hear these stories. We Listen to these tall tales of ancient people living and learning and changing because of what they learned. And we hear the story, and it becomes a part of us in turn. That's the power of a really good story. There's this piece of theology that I really like. It's been shared and spoken of by very distinguished theologically thinking folks. And uh, the three major religious traditions of the world, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, that might be why I like it so much. Uh, it's one of those really important moments of connection across scriptures and belief systems. Uh, the language varies depending on the tradition, but I'm going to borrow the language used by Elie Wiesel, who is a writer and Holocaust survivor who actually died this past week. It goes like this. It is entirely possible that God created humans because God loves stories. It's entirely possible that God created humans because God loves stories. I love that. I use it a ton in ministry because our stories are how we connect to each other and to God full stop. If we want to truly get to know someone, we share our stories and we listen to them. Stories are what takes a person from stranger to friend, from disagreement to at least begrudging respect. It's really hard to hate someone once you know their story. Stories are how we state to the world and to God precisely who we are and where we came from and where we might be going and what hurdles we overcame to get there. But what is a life but a collection of stories? And if it's entirely possible that God created humans because God loves stories, then our lives, our very existences are sacred. 
what are our scriptures, if not stories of people who lived and did stuff and told people about it, who told people about it, who told people about it, begot, begot, begotten, until somebody wrote it down. Stories, the language we use to tell them, so often they shape what we know for sure to be true about God and about humanity. From the time we are children, this is why I think kids' ministry is so very important to our church and to the world. And it's certainly why Scott and I chose to devote an entire series to these epic, heroic stories in the Bible. I might be biased, however, because I do come from a long line of devoted fish storytellers. And when Scott and I were divvying up the stories for this series, I requested Jonah because I feel a bit of a kinship with Jonah. You see, I too have been eaten by a whale. Kind of. You see, for three years during seminary, I was pretty sure I had the best holiday job in the world. I think I've talked about it before, but I performed in the Shed Holiday Fantasy Show at the Shed Aquarium in Chicago. So this meant that for two months each winter, I got paid to sing and play guitar while dolphins and belugas swam around us, doing behaviors and penguins marched stately across a walkway, and a sea lion named Ty saluted the trainer to earn himself a mouthful of restaurant-grade fish. It was like living in a holiday-themed Lisa Frank folder, and it was awesome. Then I got paid, and I could buy Christmas presents. Less than awesome was the fact that the busy schedule always intersected with the run-up to finals week at school. And it meant that my Christmas Eves were spent doing five shows in a row during uh, the holidays with a tiny lunch break. So most of my memories of the holidays during those years uh, revolve around broken guitar strings, rubber wading boots, frantic paper writing in the performer's green room, and missing my family so much it hurt. There was this part of the show where we would put on wading boots, and we would trudge out uh, into the water across this underwater platform with our guitar and our mic and everything, and sing a song about how glad we were that we were home for the holidays, which I always thought was ironic because none of us actually got to be home for the holidays. And the last year I did the show, during our final rehearsal, I was standing out on this rock. I had one foot up on the boulder and the other in the water next to the edge of the platform, and all of a sudden I felt this light pressure on my foot. We were mid-song, but I glanced down and I was shocked to see this huge, beautiful, glowing white beluga nudging my foot with its mouth. The big squishy melon on their forehead, which they used for sonar, was bobbing back and forth. And we weren't supposed to interact with the animals while we were in the enclosure. Their training is really, really specific, so it would be really easy for us to mess it up if we did something wrong. And so we weren't supposed to make eye contact with them even, but here was this kind, giant, beautiful animal trying really hard to get my attention. I was good, I turned away and I kept singing, and pretty soon the nudging turned into Nibbling. Nothing menacing or anything like that, just the aquatic mammal equivalent of a little kid poking you, trying to get your attention. And the trainer was standing beside, behind me saying, it's okay, ignore her, she'll go away, she's just trying to play, keep calm. And I'm like, how could I possibly stay calm? This is the coolest thing that's ever happened. And pretty soon the nibbling turned into outright pressure all around my foot. And I couldn't help myself. I looked down and my entire foot was enveloped in the mouth of a beluga, which is not something that happens every day. I'm not sure if I stopped guitaring, but I definitely stopped singing for a moment, and rules went out the window, and I looked deeply into the eyes of this beautiful animal, and I got lost for a second. There's a depth in the eyes of these animals, right? Like they've seen some stuff and they ain't talking. Like they know something we don't. Like maybe they're really used to God using them to get humans' attention, used to being used to remind us of mutuality and that we're all connected to each other and to the world and nature and God, and it happens so often that their perception and understanding have ascended to a whole nother level or something like that. I don't know. But we had a moment, that whale and I, and it's kind of weird and it's really hard to explain, but in that moment it didn't matter how homesick I was or how 
much I desperately wanted to be home for the holidays, like the song said, or how much finals homework I had that I'd been stressing about, that whale had called me back to the present for just a moment, welcomed me there, invited me for just a moment of connection at a time when I felt utterly disconnected by chewing on my foot. I suddenly remembered where I was, and I returned to my music, and the whale remembered where she was, and she returned to her splashing and her breaching, and the moment had passed. The next day, one of my professors, who knew how stressed I was, uh, asked me how the aquarium gig was going, and I was like, oh my gosh, the most amazing thing happened yesterday, and I told him, and he laughed. That was like a Jonah moment to me. His eyes narrowed. So Katie, what was God trying to tell you? What was God trying to tell you? We are a people and a world of intertwining stories. We're profoundly connected through experiences and computer screens and water and shared laughter and miles traveled together than we could possibly comprehend. And I think it's easy to forget that or at the very least ignore it. When faced with odds that seem insurmountable, or people that seem too different, or schedules that seem too hectic, it's really tempting to shut down, to run the other direction, to avoid the stories that connect us, to ignore the still speaking voice calling us to stop for a second and remember who we are, where we come from, to whom we belong to celebrate our inevitable connectedness, even if just for a second, and tell our stories. We are a people of stories. Good, bad, hero, anti-hero. They connect us and they all belong to God. So what's your story?